Welcome to season two of Self Careish. It's selfish with care. I'm Megan, your host, and each week I spend about 20 minutes to an hour unpacking different ways to fill your cup after a divorce, or if you're on a dating or self-dating journey. Either way, enjoy and let's get into it. Hey, I am. Recording this from tropical Bali. At the end of last season, I mentioned I was going to practice a little of what I preach and do some selfish self care and take a decent break off. And all that, even though I'm a little bit like a shark in the sense that I don't ever really sleep, I just keep swimming through the metaphorical ocean, even during my off time. Inverted commas. But it's been nice to kind of just take the pressure off posting and get creative again on my own speed because I am the kind of person that gets really energized by doing creative things, and I consider these moments where you and I can just riff together to be one of my favorite outlets. And I also love getting your responses in my DMs and in my voicemails. So this is a two-way conversation, people. Remember that. But we're here again, another season. <laughs> Last season of self careish was very valuable, but also very much a journal of my own specific experiences post divorce. And I always aim to keep things firmly focused on you. But if you read between the lines, you can definitely calculate where I was at different moments along those last seventeen weeks. If you go back, and you and I, we did a lot. We processed a few tips on divorce and breaking up, and we talked. Dating apps, and we talked deleting dating apps, and we chatted about talking finances with your new partners, and we ended on tantric sex, or as I like to think of it, the slowing down episode. This season, I think we're going to play with practicalities, building your metaphorical scaffolding for how you want to architect your life for the future, because that's kind of what divorce does to you. You start to look at your life in terms of before. And after, and the after concept is what truly scares people. And I know it certainly did me when I was staring down the barrel of my own marriage ending. I grappled with the notion that, well, I've been okay with this general acceptable level of dissatisfaction for so many years. Maybe I should just, you know, see this thing through. And I'll be honest, I did try that for a very long time in my marriage, but it is. Incredible how much your internal emotions play out on you physically when you try to smother them down. Like I was always sick. I used to get really bad sore throats, like almost strep throat, quite regularly. And I, you know, I don't want to get woo woo here, but someone who's really spiritual told me that that is because you are constricting your voice and not saying your truth. That's what I'm doing now, I guess. No sore throats here anymore. But back then, yeah, I wasn't good. I was unfit. I was bloated. I had three or four gin and tonics at night so we could, you know, relax and talk because that was the norm. I didn't look into the future and feel invigorated because I didn't feel in charge. So I was just sort of going along with things and just letting life happen. Looking back internally, something else happened that I find pretty fascinating. Now I can put a name on it. I felt older than my years. There's a saying on TikTok at the moment that 35 in the city is 25, and 35 in the suburbs is 45. And I think that the joke is because when you're in the suburbs and you're, you know, parenting and married and everything just kind of ages you because it's so debilitating sometimes. And not all the time. I know married people do listen to this show, and you know everyone's marriage is hard, and every relationship comes with its own challenges. I don't think that that's what ages you. I think when you're in a bad relationship or it's not working, and it's like a negative environment, that is what ages you. Like physically, not as energized, but mentally. When things are bad, you get sluggish, apathetic, which of course doesn't help the relationship anyway. So it's like this compounding interest of negative relationship energy layered upon negative self-image, which in turn reinforces negative relationship energy. It's horrific. So for me, something had to change, and that's how I ended up here in Bali, single. Sharing a villa with another single girlfriend, sipping cocktails by the pool, knowing my child is safe in his normal routine with his dad because we co-parent. 
And I'm here to say I feel younger now than I did before. And this is where we get to the topic of today's pod. How old do you feel? Like, what's your subjective age? If I asked you to give me a number, what would you say? I was also prompted to do this episode because Bali is renowned for being the land of the quarter and midlife crisis. It is an island of thousands of people who are mentally 28 to 35. The 40-year-old guys only want to date women in their 20s. The 20-year-old guys are looking for cougars and the 40-year-old women are all too happy to oblige. And no hate to anyone for it. In fact, there is a lot of negative press around the midlife crisis. And I get it. The stereotype is, you know, the middle-aged guy who cheats on his wife with his secretary and goes and buys a Porsche and rides off into the sunset, leaving just emotional carnage behind him. But I think we're seeing a new type of midlife crisis. And I think we should change the name of the midlife crisis to the midlife resurgence or reemergence. Say you get married in your 20s, you settle down in the burbs, you do everything right, and somehow, for whatever reason, things go to shit. Maybe a global pandemic hits, I don't know. And you're forced out of the womb of a relationship and back into life again. You are, for all intents and purposes, reborn. It's literally no wonder why people feel mentally younger once they're out, because they haven't really lived since their 20s. And like I always say, it's not just me saying this. Let's take a music break and I'll come back into it and explain what I mean. As I was saying, if you and I were honest with each other, like really, we'd admit that we don't really feel the age that we are chronologically. We would say that we perpetually feel somewhere in the realm between, say, 26 to 35. And this is due to something researchers call the reminiscence bump. So it's this idea that most adults collect the most memories from age 15 to 25. So this is why whenever you hear Country Grammar by Nelly on the radio or something, you feel such an emotive pull because it's from your foundational years. And it goes both ways. According to research scientists, younger people, say people who are in their teens, always feel older than their years. And that's something I think we can all agree on and remember. I mean, who didn't feel old enough to see an R-rated movie at 12 years old? Or I don't know, think they were old enough to stay home alone at 13? And the reason, according to David Rubin of Duke University, who looked into this phenomenon, is this. Those who view themselves younger, say like, I don't know, you and me, reportedly feel more optimistic about the future. What they're doing is actually imagining the many generative years ahead, things to achieve, places to go, people to sleep with. And those who view themselves older, I hear you ask, you could say that Teens consider themselves older because they feel that weight and burden of hormones in the future looming ahead. I don't know. That's one to ask your kids about. But I'm here. I'm 38 and I can't believe it. But I also don't mind it. And we are so lucky to live in a time when 40 isn't what it used to be, guys. I mean, it's like Seinfeld, right? Did you know that Elaine was meant to be 28 in Seinfeld and George Costanza was meant to be in his early 30s. I mean, that is absolutely wild to me. Early 30s back then is very different to what it is now, which is great for us. And we live in the era of Botox and fillers, which is fine if you don't partake, I totally get it. But we also don't smoke. We don't drink as much. I mean, the non-alcoholic section at Dan Murphy's just keeps getting larger and larger. And P.S. I'm not saying don't drink. I'm just saying, look, we've got options now. People are living longer. 40s is not even middle age anymore. It's like early summer, late spring. I don't know. That's what it feels like. And you're likely going to live until you're 90. So for me and my ex, That's potentially 50 more years of adventures to have and things to learn and achieve and mistakes to make and food to eat and luggage to lose and love to experience. And if you do it right, you can enjoy every second of it. 
well, not every second, obviously, but ma- the majority of it. There's so much goodness ahead, and that's what this season is all about. So thanks for tuning in for this episode of Self Careish, and we have some really cool things in the pipeline over the next few months, including special self care deals only available to subscribers of the show. And I'm talking newsletter subscribers, people. If you jump onto self care dash ish or self care dash ish dot com dot au, subscribe, slide into the newsletter community, and you can get some pretty hefty deals on Botox, massages, I don't know, um, like fillers, anything you want. Like I'm bringing it to you. I'm bringing the self care to your inbox, and it's not just tips and tricks, although that that's helpful too. So yeah, subscribe and I'll fill your inbox with good vibes and discounts. And you can also leave me a voicemail on the website. So have your say on anything we've discussed in this or previous episodes. I'm here for you. I'm here to riff. And if you just want to share memes, you can by following us on Instagram at podcast on IG. And I'm on TikTok at Megan Lonrigan. But anyway, all the links are in the show notes to make it super easy. I am mega glad that you're here. I'll see you next Wednesday.